So here we are. We're rolling. Uh, Penn and Clark, and we're going to be talking about Charles Finney. So first, I'm going to start with a very general question: um, Why? And, and spiritually, can, you know, context of this question is uh, why does the study of our history matter? Hmm. The reason history matters is that. Uh, God does things in, in increments and, and he, there's a pattern to what he does. And so often what he, ha what he has done, he will do. And we want that. We, we want um, to be consistent with history. We want to be um, parts of history. You have to understand history to see what God's doing. It, it puts language on oftentimes what he's doing today. Awesome. I like that. Um, oh, I should have mentioned some of the themes this might flow through your brain as you give answers. Of course, revival, um, freedom. These are the thing, big themes of the film. Freedom, uh, the influence of, of this region, mm -hmm. um, and of course the influence of the revival. Uh, unity and identity. So just keep those in mind. Those okay. are some of the aims. So big question, who was Charles Finney? Who was Charles Finney? Well, he was a young man that um, experienced personal revival, and then God used him in the most remarkable way. And I see him as a John the Baptist kind of guy. John the Baptist was from outside the religious system. He wasn't part of the Pharisaical system. He wasn't. He 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 wasn't. Um, he wasn't part of the mainstream Judaism. God used him from the outside to come in. In fact the inside and and upset the religious system. And in a lot of ways, Finney did that. That's cool. That's awesome. Um, I know that we want to talk about his conversion experience, so that I didn't write that down here, but can you mention anything? Like what, describe what that was the in Adam's mm -hmm. in the woods sort of situation. Okay. Um, Charles Finney had been away working and going to school in New Jersey. His mother wasn't feeling well. She wrote him a letter and asked him to come home. So he comes back to Henderson. There's really not much happening in Henderson. It's a very, very small town. The, the nearest big town is Adams, New York. He goes there. He signs up for an apprenticeship. Never does become a lawyer, but you get on the job training. Uh, he's reading law books, uh, Blackstone commentaries on, on law were mostly based on Old Testament principles. And so he's reading them with fascination. He decides to order a Bible and he gets a Bible and he begins to read it. He's also going to church. And um, he wasn't really a churchman. He wasn't raised in the, in the church. And so for him to go to church on his own, um, it was mostly social and he was very musical. He had a good singing voice and he became the choir director. Well, one of the young girls in the choir began praying for him. He eventually married her. Um, so a lot of factors were coming together. Uh, there's also a sovereign part of, of the story. There's a thing called the spirit of prayer that was moving in that region. Finney said of that time, he said, I didn't bring revival. I was born again in revival. What he called revival was a sovereign shadow of a movement of God that was going from hamlet to hamlet and came to Adams, he was swept up in that. Many people were. And uh, he came under conviction by reading Blackstone commentaries, came under conviction by reading the Bible. He couldn't get, a, uh, couldn't put down the Bible. He kept, kept reading it. Someone would come into the office, he'd cover it up with other books so that they wouldn't see that he was doing it. And, uh, but he was under amazing conviction himself. And to get peace in his soul to find some kind of a relief from the conviction. He went out of, out of town, over a hill, into a little forest, got on his knees and began to pray and cry out to God. So then something changed where he really began to wonder whether he could even really be saved, whether God would actually save him. And he spent a lot of time out there praying, came out of that experience, still not fully understanding all that happened, uh, loaded up the fireplace with logs in the law office, Business was shut down for the day. He sat in there and he had an experience. The living Christ stepped into his now. Uh, he said liquid waves of love over, overwhelmed him. Uh, he had a real encounter with the Lord. 
When he came out of that experience, he noticed that all the logs that he put on the fireplace had burned down to ashes. So he wasn't sure how long that happened. But from that time on, he felt called to ministry. He was totally committed to the Lord, uh, quit the, the, the uh, practice of law, which he was studying, um, told people that he wasn't going to continue looking after their cases. Uh, he had a remarkable conversion. And that marked everything. From that time on, that's what he expected to see happen for anyone that he was preaching to, that they'd have a, a real encounter with the living Christ. Wow. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't even on here. So that, is, that was really good. Um, gen general big questions here. What happened in Rochester? Well, Rochester happened about five years after that experience. And he'd been preaching... Um, uh, for about five years, and so maybe a little longer than that. I think he started preaching maybe three years after that conversion experience where he was sent out as an evangelist and um, uh, was in the backwater, was in the backwoods in a no man's land. It was really uh, a wilderness area and very small hamlets, and he would go by horseback from town to town. And... Um, so all of his experience was in really remote places, places like DeKalb are still remote to this day. So when he gets down into, um, along the canal system, it's bigger towns, actual cities, like Rome and, and Utica are, are, are burgeoning towns. Rochester's starting to emerge as a city. And uh, he goes to Rochester. He actually didn't even plan to go to Rochester. He met in Whitestown with a group of people who prayed for him and people that he trusted their counsel. And they, uh, he had invitations to go to Philadelphia. He had an invitation to go to New York City. And he got an invitation to go to Rochester, New York. And as he read it, it didn't sound very inviting. That's actually what he said. It wasn't a very inviting invitation. Religion was low. The churches were divided. And uh, as they talked about it, they said, no, you should go to New York City. So that was his conviction. That was his sense of leading. He went to bed that night, the next morning, went down to the canal to step on the canal. He could go east or west. And he found himself, uh, because of a conversation that the Lord had with him the night before, he found himself stepping on a canal, a barge that was heading west to Rochester rather than east to the mighty metropolis of, of New York City. The conversation went something like this. He said, all the things you list as reasons not to go to Rochester Religion is low. Uh, the churches uh, are not really united. Um, um, uh, it's a small population. All the, all the reasons not to go, um, they, these are the reasons you should go. And uh, if they were, uh, had everything together, you wouldn't, they wouldn't need you. You wouldn't have to go there. We, we hear that kind of thing in the Bible. And so it really fits that, that description. So he gets on the barge goes to Rochester, and the rest is history. He becomes uh, uh, a nationally known preacher, largely based on what happened to Rochester. Yeah, that's really good. That's awesome. We're actually considering, let me shut this off, we're actually considering going to Rome. I understand they have the old barge and horse there still, and maybe getting just a few artists. That'd be good to do. Yeah. yeah, there's a couple things. There's a um, a canal museum in Syracuse that's really worthwhile. Lots okay. of beautiful photographs, they, and they have a replica of a barge. There's another one that uh, is geared around kids. You can actually get on a barge and see it. Wow. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that's New York history. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this big revival, um, how does this affect the identity of the city of Rochester in the region? Um, I think the way it affects... Rochester, um, probably put Rochester on the map more than like uh, any of the um, uh, engineering or manufacturing. It was a flower town. It was a mill town. Um, it's famous for a lot of other things since. But when people think of Rochester, they think of the, the Finney revivals. There was nothing quite like that where a whole city was impacted by revival. Um, there's a book called Shopkeeper's Millennium where a man documented 
the social and economic changes of an entire city that came out of a, of a, a revival. And he's not writing it to promote revival like I would. He's writing it to show uh, when something good like that comes to a town and it affected all the classes of people from the upper class, the middle class, the lower ca uh, class, it really changed the whole city. It changed the economics. It changed the social fabric of that city. Very few things that you could point to anywhere where that has happened, but it happened because of revival. Yeah, that's cool. Um, why, maybe this question is not a right, the right question, but um, you can you can deem it if it's correct or not. Why was he a controversial preacher or even maybe how he's judged as a controversial mm -hmm. preacher? Uh, Finney was a controversial preacher. Uh, preacher and in part because he he did things differently he wasn't trained as a as a pastor he was self-taught uh, spoke differently acted differently conducted himself differently uh, I've, I've studied his life extensively from beginning to end been to most of the places where where uh, he lived and worked he was a really decent quality man who finished well he, his whole ministry finished well no moral, no immorality, no blemishes on his teaching or his character or anything like that. But uh, because revival stirred things up and some of his methods in, in getting to the heart of people were different than what everyone was expecting or different than normal church, uh, he became controversial. Um, you have to understand that the uh, Presbyterian church was incredibly legalistic. It was by, by far the most influential church in, in New England, but had gotten very legalistic. Um, a man would be excommunicated, for example, for checking his sap buckets on the, on the Sabbath day. So he'd be kicked out of church, essentially sent to hell for checking his sap buckets. And then you had extreme liberal uh, Unitarianism on the other side of it. And so Finney kind of comes through and he, and he does things that is, is neither or. He carves out a third way. And um, uh, challenged the status quo, challenged typical religion. The, uh, the legalists hated him. The real liberals hated him. And so there was nothing he could do. Everything he did was controversial. Yeah. <laughs> what a time. Um, so let's, let's describe uh, what was the experience a person would have. You went to this this one of his services, you know, especially during the revival, what are you going to experience? Well, uh, first of all, revival wasn't normal. They had known of a revival called the Great Awakening. So some people would have known something of that. But now it's happening to their town and uh, the places will be packed out. People are very curious as to what what's going to happen. Uh, uh, some people didn't know what to expect from this young guy, Finney. And um, uh, what they weren't expecting, what they could never have calculated, it wasn't just his oratory, it wasn't his personality or him as a person. The sovereignness of God, a, a spirit of prayer, which we would call today the glory of the Lord, accompanied him everywhere he went. So people would pack out the meeting house, they would be there, and all of a sudden something would settle that created conviction. People were in agony, people were in pain, physical pain, people crying out, people couldn't stop crying. Uh, and it was very real, it was very geographic, it was very real. I remember reading a story about a soldier uh, in Rome, New York, who was trying to get back to the fort, Fort Stanwix, where they were holding meetings in a nearby courthouse and a nearby church. There's a road in between those two buildings that led to the fort. This man heard about the glory of the Lord, heard about the spirit of prayer, this conviction that would come upon people. He didn't want that for himself. So he rode his horse full gallop through town so that it wouldn't fall upon him. I mean, in his mind, it was tangible. In his mind, it was real. And it really was something like that, almost like a divine shadow that went over the place. And they would track it. They would say, the spirit of prayer is here. The spirit of prayer is moving there. It's come to this town. And one of the hallmarks were people were under conviction. They began to cry. They became aware of their sins. 
Uh, and this and were church people who weren't converted. They were attending church, but not necessarily converted. And um, uh, they called it the spirit of prayer because there are people who are prayerless. But when that came through, they couldn't stop praying. And that was the main feature of this thing is that it caused people to turn to God. That was happening anytime Finney was ministering. And sometimes he would follow it and if, learn where it was happening. And he'd go there and get his nets in and preach point blank, um, um, demanding people surrender to God. No one was doing that. And as a result, people came to Christ. And so it was like he got his nets in where the water was stirring. And many people came to Christ that way. Wow, that's a great description. Um, um, tell us, uh, you described for me in the past, um, tell us about his way of speaking and how he delivered his messages, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think you mentioned how he's more common language versus <laughs> the hierarchical kind of heady. Yeah, describe, describe how he speaks. Well. Finney was an unusual preacher for his day. Most people were very formal, uh, wearing clerical garb um, because they were trained at Yale and Harvard, um, Oxford, different, different, uh, different schools um, of education. And Finney avoided that. He, didn't, he wasn't trained in a school and wasn't co didn't come from a Christian background, uh, immediate Christian background. He had Christian roots, but not immediately, not his mother and father. And so he was just a, a local boy. He was smart, he was always smart, always intelligent, had a good voice, uh, quick mind, and, um, but, but wasn't interested in religion and didn't approach things religiously. He recalled his own pastor when he was a boy, when he did get a chance to attend the church, a, a Reverend Star. And, and he wouldn't, the pastor wouldn't look at the people, would speak over the heads of the people, would use the classics and refer to uh, things from Greek history to try to communicate Bible truths to these local farm people. Most people did not have a clue what he was talking about. When Finney preached, it was different. He looked at the people, he, he used language that they could understand. Uh, one guy said Finney was two hours into a sermon before they realized that it had even begun. In other words, it was conversational. Um, he referred back to his own pastor where he'd put his fingers in the Bible to mark his passages. And with earnest, people would wait, counting the fingers because they couldn't wait for the sermon to be done. They were each finger that was pulled out, they were just eager to wait for that sermon to get over. That's not true of Finney. Finney was an amazing preacher. One guy, he said that he'd heard all the great preachers and there was no one like Finney. One thing that made him unique, uh, he didn't write his sermons out. Someone said that he probably didn't write out f two full sermons in his entire lifetime. He'd have little outlines, but he preached what we call by the spirit. He, he looked for a word for the moment. He didn't have a canned sermon that he took every place. What he felt the Lord was telling him to speak in that moment, that's what he spoke. And he spoke from the heart, he spoke with passion. He was a wonderful storyteller. He could illustrate things with ordinary, everyday kinds of things in life, almost like he'd preach out of the newspaper, what was common, what was ordinary for people. Two guys were talking and they were saying how uh, Finney described a Northern New York winter in one of his sermons. And he described it so clearly described it uh, so um, vividly that they were shocked when they went out of the meeting house to find that it was a perfectly normal spring day uh, because he took them to winter. Um, some people have Finney as a kind of a Gatlin gun or machine gun preacher. He really wasn't that way. He was direct, he was plain, but he spoke in a conversational way. Um, but there are very few, few preachers of his day who could speak like that. Uh, most people held, were trapped by notes, held notes, would work through their notes. It was stilted, dry, and detached. His was personal. Really good. Wow, that, that's really good. Um, let's see. You may have touched on these things a little bit, but you can reiterate any thoughts 
Um, how did his methods differ from preachers of his day? Hmm. Uh, Finney's methods were different, not just in his personal delivery of sermons. Um, he was after the conversion of men. Most of his um, peers in religion and the Presbyterian Church didn't even think about that. They, they weren't aware that you could actually choose to become a Christian. Either you were a Christian or you weren't. The idea that you could choose, the idea that you could just choose now, kind of a, the way Billy Graham presented it. Uh, no one was doing that. Uh, very few people, I should say, were was doing that. Um, it was it was just kind of accepted. Either you know you're you're in the church and you're going to church and you're accepted. Uh, you're a member of a church, therefore you're going to heaven. That wasn't Finney's experience, and that's not what God was showing him to do. And so he actually made Christians uncomfortable. He would challenge them whether or not they're Christians. He said, "I won't even preach to you again until you tell me whether you're." want to accept Christ. And he was doing that in churches. So it wasn't just unbelievers. It was the believers he was going after. Nobody was doing that at the time. Um, and so that was very upsetting for people. One guy, he said, uh, he said to Finney, if I, when I see him, I would thrash him. He said, then when I saw him, if any was six foot two, muscular, powerfully built, athletic build, he said, when I saw him, I, I realized I, I probably couldn't thrash him. And when I heard him, I didn't want to. I, I, I would do anything he asked me to do. Finney was incredibly, incredibly persuasive and magnetic and, and would look at people with these piercing blue eyes. And he was a handsome, um, intelligent young man. And, and, and that made him different. Most pastors were old and not very relevant. He was relevant. People flocked to hear him speak. I read one story of uh, Finney coming to Evans Mills for the very first time. He'd been sent out by the Women's Missionary Society. So the word was coming that a pastor was coming, a preacher was coming to town. And um, uh, he's listed as, as one of the first preachers of this, of this village. And so uh, they were expecting him. And so a boy who was there when they were talking about the preachers coming, the preachers coming, he thought, what kind of monster is this preacher? What He had never seen a preacher, so he didn't know what to expect. Uh, the preachers coming and the people were filled with dread and uh, cleaning the thing up and cleaning up the house and, and uh, acting differently. So in his little mind, he's wondering, what is this preacher? and What's the preacher going to do? He said that everyone was so surprised when, when Finney reined up on his horse and uh, started to take off his jacket and he bounded up the stairs. He was a young guy, he was very handsome and uh, spoke friendly and, and greeted everyone, including the boy, and then said, where are the praying women at? He wanted to find out, uh, how to get right down to business, get right down to um, starting uh, his ministry with prayer. And uh, they, when they told him, he punched his arm back in his coat, got back on his horse and took off. That little boy never forgot that. And he told it to one of Finney's daughters when, years later. It had such an impact on him because he was so different than anything anyone could have expected. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, let's see. What was the anxious bench? Well, the anxious seat or the anxious bench was part of the new measures. Uh, there's a little place called Feltz Mills, New York, and that's where Finney first did this um, anxious seat where he actually called people to stand and come forward if they're anxious for their salvation, if they're anxious and people were under conviction. Uh, later he wrote about it, it and he, he said he didn't use that, those measures very much until he got to Rochester. There he perfected it. It's what we call today the altar call. And it's essentially having people stand uh, to indicate to everybody that you're anxious for your salvation and that you're wanting to part from sin. So he did it. He did it. He said it was a very important step to take, especially the higher you up were in society. Uh, if you were high up in society, there was a pride, there was a social standing. And that would sometimes impede people from really receiving the Lord. So to have them stand up in public and actually everyone could see 
that you were anxious for your soul. And then they reserved some seats up front and people would actually go up there and sit and sit to think about their sins. Think about the uh, possibility of having them take away. Uh, think about giving their lives to Christ. It was a means of submission. And uh, once he saw the wisdom of it, once he saw the effect it had, he used it like nobody else. Got him in a lot of trouble. But we do the same thing today. We think that it's, it's wrong to make it too easy to people. Uh, it, should be, it should be something that goes against their pride. God gives grace to the humble. And anything you can do to, to bring that about, you should do. And that's what Finney mastered. That's awesome. Very cool. I can hear the bells, but I don't have a problem with it. It's <laughs> kind of nice. <laughs> Church bells? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Must be. Is it across the... Must be. Yeah. yeah. I can barely hear it, but it's in there. Huh. All right. Anxious bench. All right. We're, you already told us about the spirit of prayer, so I don't need to ask okay. that. What is the connection? Uh, unless you want to expand a little more, the next question is, um, what was the connection with prayer and his success? Maybe you could mention Abel Clary or mm -hmm. Father Nash and any others, you know, that sort of thing. So that's the question. What was the connection with prayer and his success? It seems like right from the very beginning, Finney became dependent upon prayer. He was, he was really humble in that regard. He didn't think it was going to be his personality, his own persuasiveness. He knew that if God didn't do it, it wasn't going to happen. So from the very first town that he went into, he asked, where, where are the praying women at? Where are the praying people at? And um, he collected people who loved to pray and who knew that um, it was more than a principle. It was more than a pattern. It was an absolute necessity. And um, so everywhere he went, uh, the spirit of prayer happened. People um, couldn't stop praying. He just saw it was life changing. And he collected people, people like Daniel Nash, uh, Abel Clary, his dad, he would have known him in Adams. And Abel Clary, especially in Rochester, um, never came to the meetings, but tucked himself away and agonized in prayer. It's a Romans 8 kind of thing where he's allowing the Holy Spirit to pray through them in, with groanings that cannot be uttered, bringing about the will of God. Finney knew that, knew that's what was happening and was dependent upon it for everything, everywhere he went. Not only did he pray a lot, but he, he collected people who believed that. And that was true for the rest of his life. That was true for the entire breadth of his ministry. Yeah, perfect. All right. Um, oh, now tell me, it's who was Finney's greatest inspiration? I want to hear about the Jonathan Edwards book story. Um, Early in his development, uh, there was an elder Hinman who was a really uh, influence and encouragement on Finney. Um, I think he would have known of Jonathan Edwards and the Wesley brothers. He would have known all of that kind of thing. But when he came out of the backwoods and got to Rome and Utica, he actually met professional pastors for, for the very first time who are peers now and who treated him as a peer. And... Um, they had studies, they had uh, bookshelves, which were books were very, very expensive back then. Um, but there was a, a pastor who befriended him in Utica, New York, and um, uh, he stayed in his house. And he introduced him to Jonathan Edwards, gave him an actual book about Jonathan Edwards, and later commented, he said, I've never, I never saw Finney after that without him having that book in his hand. It was like it was like he was experiencing things that Edwards experienced, but now he's reading about it. He's reading someone else who had a very similar experience, someone else who could put language to it, someone else who normalized it, because uh, the things he was experiencing in revival weren't widely known and um, uh, very few contemporaries that he could talk to. So when he came across that book about Jonathan Edwards, it's like meeting a friend who knows what you're going through, who understands what you're going through. Uh, he didn't have anybody like that that he could talk to who, who really understood. But in Jonathan Edwards, he felt he found like a, 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 a soulmate or a kinsman, someone who had been down that same road and could understand and who was also um, 
um, a, a real theologian who really understood the Bible and brought it, brought it alive for Finney. So he always walked around with that book in his hand. Aside from Jonathan Edwards, um, I can't think of anybody. Um, there are other contemporary preachers and, and better known preachers, uh, you know, the, the, the Lyman Beechers and Nettledons. But uh, when he got to meet them, he was disappointed with, with um, the quality of their spiritual life and what they really knew about the things of God. So he really didn't, he, he's kind of peerless until he meets Edwards. That's good. Very good. All right, well, that's the end of my main questions. Uh, the last thing I wrote, so um, we definitely want to pursue the, the Finney and uh, Douglas uh, interaction story at Oberlin. Um, it's really turning out to be so significant to the end of our story. It's, I know it's flashing back a little, but to have someone who represents personifies Rochester like a Frederick Douglass, yeah. you know, losing the, it's kind of the story of Rochester, you know, having lost its first Absolutely. love, chasing after the prosperity and the things of the world. So to have it stated so powerfully and succinctly is great. I'm just looking for some, some sort of setup statement or something. I, I'm not really sure if you've given this any thought, but, uh, uh, what did I, I'll just sort of read what I wrote here for. For the closer, we are looking for a statement that will set up the Finney Douglas story at Oberlin. You know, think about something you might say that would have some punch where we then immediately go into the story. Uh, it will be the final scene of our film. I think, oh, I said I will think about this too. Mm. I haven't too much. <laughs> um, so I, maybe, I think I know of an approach that okay. might work. So. Yes. Finney was after getting people connected with Jesus and getting people to heaven. That was his focus. He wasn't focused altogether on the social ramifications of that. Uh, it, was, it was to get the gospel out, to get the gospel into the hearts of people. Once they're awakened and once their conscience was renewed, the, the social conscience against slavery, against um, the way they treated people in prisons, prison reform, uh, even dietary reform, temperance movement, uh, where alcoholism and abuse of alcohol was ruining families. All of a sudden, people became socially aware. So what Finney brought, he wasn't shooting for that and he wasn't preaching about that, even though Finney's uh, own brother was a temperance preacher. Finney was an evangelist. He was going after souls. But once, it, once a soul was awakened and a conscience was clear, then they wanted to focus on what they could do to help other people. And out of that came uh, the temperance movement, the abolitionist movement. Finney's not known as an abolitionist preacher, but, but his, his converts uh, wanted to do something that would help their fellow man. Uh, the, the, all the social issues concerning how women were treated um, they were also affected. Every, every part of society was touched by the rev revivals. And I think that's what should happen is wholeness should happen in the wake of a revival. Um, wholeness, body, soul, and spirit should be improved because of a, re of a revival. And uh, uh, Frederick Douglass uh, had known the Lord in his youth, um, was incredibly bright, articulate, a magnetic personality. Uh, but I be, became aware of him through his relationships with Abraham Lincoln, where he would actually become like an outside conscience to Lincoln, demanding that he speak up about this and about the slavery issue and, and um, uh, use um, African-American soldiers as, um, in, to fight the battles. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln loved Douglas, and Douglas became very influential, comes to Rochester, um, starts a, a newspaper, which uh, was unheard of. I can't think of anybody in that day of, from where he came to the place of uh, public influence that he had. Um, but Douglas was incredibly influential. Later in life, he goes to Oberlin, where Finney is preaching. And uh, there's an amazing story of Finney praying for rain. And rain came as a result of uh, his prayers and it stopped a drought. Uh, Frederick Douglass was in that meeting. Uh, Finney, it was such a miracle in people's minds. They had a second meeting 
Finney begins to preach to get people to, to surrender to God at a deeper level. And Frederick Douglass stood up and asked if he could speak. And he said that when I was in my youth, that he knew the Lord and he got away from it because of his success and because of his prosperity and that he was rededicating his life to Christ as a, as a elder statesman now, as an older man. And it was uh, Finney himself was old, an old man at that time. But it's just a, a tremendous story to, to show that um, the social justice and the social movements, if that, if, if that is the, f- the primary focus, you can actually get away from the Lord. Um, it, it can't be just the primary focus. The primary focus has to be spiritual, has to be eternal. It benefits everything else. Um, but it can't be the primary focus then or today. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Uh, the last thing then <clears throat> is if you can speak into something about identity, um, using that word again, uh, about how similar to what you just ended with, of uh, you know, when we find our identity in Christ, you know, in God's purpose for us, that then feeds into... Mm-hmm. And social justice is a good word to use because it's a buzzword for this generation, even though it carries some negative. Yeah, but, but I don't, I don't mind that um, if you just kind of frame it within that God-given identity kind of, kind of thing. So, do you understand what I'm asking? Yes. Yeah. Speaking of yeah. that somehow. Well, Finney had set his sights on becoming a lawyer. Uh, never went to the bar. Never achieved that. He wanted to get away from the poverty of his youth. He wanted to get away from the farm. His brothers were all farmers. He, he wanted to be successful. But it wasn't until he met Jesus that he came into an experience that unleashed his potential. And he came into his purpose. And his purpose was helping the ordinary person get in touch with God, have, having the ordinary person be able to relate to the Bible and, and, and experience the, the gospel on every level. Finney came into his person, into his uh, identity, um, and uh, at a level that, that none of his brothers experienced or, or many young people that weren't experiencing in that day. But he didn't just come into it for himself. He brought thousands of people into their identity. Uh, when he came to Rochester and he had meetings, the young people couldn't get over how God was using this young young man with very limited education, uh, no pedigree, no real social standing, to impact every layer of society. As a result of that, many of them uh, became pastors themselves and evangelists themselves. I think that's that's a major thing about influence. When we come into our purpose, it helps other people come into their purposes. Um, and that, that's the story of Finney. It, that's how I come into the story. I identified with this young guy, and he inspired me to be a, a preacher and a better preacher and a more effective preacher and to, to, to try to finish well. Um, it's influence. Influence affects our purpose. Our purpose affects our influence. And Finney had both of those things happening for him. Perfect. I think that's it. You got any other thought you think should be included? Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Um, Can you say anything about, um, you know, I always hear about this, this kind of diameter or radius around Rochester where people would come in within 30 miles Mm -hmm. or 50 miles or, can you give that concept? Well, Rochester was the biggest town. It was on the canal. The canal system is a super highway. Uh, before the highway came in. Um, uh, a lot of canal towns, um, Brockport, uh, everything within a, a, an hour radius, because uh, you got going down into um, Canandaigua from Rochester, um, and Finney went there and he preached. Um, he, said, he said in his autobiography that he went out to a lot of these uh, neighboring towns and preached in the 1830s. Um, uh, Rochester was a, a major hub, and uh, as a result of that, people would flock to the meetings. They'd come from the farms, they'd come from the hamlets. Um, but Finney also went out and impacted the, a, lo- a large swath of real estate that you can see the effect of that to this day. So. Yeah.
Good. I think that's it. Oh, good.